Scott Drew, Jerome Tang, round three at Bramlage Coliseum tonight. This is Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for joining another episode of Locked on Baylor brought to you by FanDuel. It is your team every day, and thank you for making it your first listen today and every day. I'm your host, Cam Stewart. We are into a new week. I know we were into a new week yesterday, but we were still kind of living off the VJ Edgecombe stuff. I am going to talk about him a little bit later in the show because it's too big to ignore. But tonight, your undefeated in Big 12 play, 14-2 and two Baylor Bears head up two while well, they've already headed up there sorry to break that to you they beat the weather are in manhattan kansas they've already lost one game in manhattan this year but that was in new york this time it's the little apple as they take on the two and one in the big 12 kansas state wildcats led by our old pal jerome tang and i'm gonna be saying this a lot when previewing big 12 teams but they're deceptively good you know, it, it's it's us. We are conditioned as humans to look at the, you know, look up who is Baylor playing tonight, and you see that Kansas State does not have a number next to their name, and you think, boy, there are eight Big 12 teams that are in the top 25, and this ain't even one of them. This should be the landing spot. No, no, no. No, no, no. Don't, don't buy into that, Okay. The same people who were buying into that bought into the Cowboys this year, and look how that turned out. Okay, don't do that. Okay, Baylor should win the game. Yes, Baylor is a better team. Yes, but don't just say they don't have a number next to their name. They are going to just lay by the wayside like there's going to be Bruce Weber's cats out there. That is not the case. Not the case at all. Uh, first off, they're very good at home. Jerome Tang has only lost two games at home in two seasons, um, so they're pretty good. So let's let's kind of take the the 5,000 foot view and really hone, then hone in on what Kansas state is really good at. Now, what surprised me was Kansas state's strength of schedule is only 94th Baylor is somewhere in the high fifties in that. Um, and Kansas state's is somehow better than Houston's according to Kent Palm. I, I don't get that. Houston just played basically two now two ranked games this week. They were, unranked at the time and they lost both and now they're ranked. So I would think that and both on the road. Uh, so I would think those would make for a better strength of schedule, but I, I guess not. I guess not. Um, Kansas state is not good on paper defending the three, which obviously Baylor's really good at. They're still number one in the nation in three point percentage after another sub 33 point shooting night, 30% three point shooting night on Saturday, uh, Kansas State's 142nd in the nation. They allow 32%. For reference, Cincinnati was way higher than that at 67th and forcing teams to shoot 30%. And they held Baylor under 30 at 25%. So a little, little point of reference there on why that is. And uh, as is, as you can maybe expect, and this was part of Part of the MO last year, although Kansas State had a little bit more talent last year, they are a defense first team. What do you expect from a Jerome Tang team? They are dogs on defense, which is very similar to what we all saw Baylor play against on Saturday against Cincinnati. Um, Kansas State is is pretty good on this end. I want to share some stats with you because I, I just mentioned they're 142nd in the nation against the three, allowing 32%. But, but... You look at the last seven games, they have allowed 59 points a game in the last seven, which includes three Big 12 games. Um, and on 37.5% shooting in those games from the floor and 29% defense uh, for the three-point. So they have are cooking now. I mean, you, they were a good defensive team before. They're very good now. Uh, in those seven games, they have allowed 60 points or less five times five times. And one of those was to, to holding Texas tech to 60 over the weekend. Now tech did win the game, which I'm going to go through in a minute. It was 60 to 59, but, but Kansas state held tech to 19 points under their season scoring average. 
Tech was averaging almost 80 points a game. They got 60. They shot just 36% and 20% from three. So this team is going to get after it on the defensive end and on the boards as well. Um, they're, I think, we're 43rd or so uh, nationally in, in uh, or excuse me, I'm reading this wrong. I had this written down wrong. They were in the top 45 of three rebounding categories. So they were 20th in offensive rebounds, 42nd in rebounds per game, and 42nd as well in rebounding margin. They're plus six rebounds a game on their opponents. Now, I mentioned that to say the team with the second best uh, rebounding differential in the country going in to Saturday was Cincinnati. And they were got out, out offensive rebounded by them, but they were dead even in terms of total rebounds. So so that's big for it. Um, and really, when you look at Kansas State, and, and I've only seen a little bit of them this year, but the numbers back this up too. They, they do have a three-headed monster on offense. Like, they're not this prolific offense, but they have three guys who can really score. In fact, uh, they sorry, two of them are over 15 points a game. The third one, Arthur Kaluma, is at 14.9 points per game. So, I mean, three guys that you roll out there as 15-point scorers is is pretty impressive. That That's going to win you some games even in this conference. Uh, Baylor, at some points this year, have rolled out four double digit scores in the starting lineup. And the only one that wasn't was Jalen Bridges at like 9.8. So there's balance scoring, uh, more balance scoring for Baylor, but Cam Carter, Tyler Perry, not the Tyler Perry and Kaluma are, are the scorers on this team. That that's the three headed monster. And it's not like this shoot the lights out team, but each, each of those guys can score inside. And for the case of two of them can score a little bit outside too. Um, and they have three players in the top 15. Those three players are in the top 15 in the scoring, in the conference in scoring. And their big rebounding guy is one of only two that return to the team, David Engesan. I don't think I said that right. Engesan? I don't know. Um, he, he averages eight and eight a game. Um, so it was him and Cam Carter are the only ones, the only ones that returned from last year's team that not only beat Baylor twice, but went to the Elite Eight. They brought in eight new guys uh, on this team. So it's it's a new-look team, but not surprising in the way that they're going to try to attack you, uh, and it's it's mostly defensively. And this is just one of those teams, and there's like five or six of them in this league that are just going to wear you out defensively, just completely wear you out and you know they're not going to light it up offensively, but they might wear you out enough to win the game. I mean, Kansas, or excuse me, um, Cincinnati was one shot away from doing that to you, from just completely wearing you out, hitting some shots at the end, and that was the way they would win the game. Uh, Baylor closed out that game pretty well against Cincinnati, had some good defensive stands, finally hit their free throws at the end of the game. Kansas State did not, did not at all, close the game out well on Saturday. We're going to talk about each team's last games coming up after this word from our sponsor. That sponsor is Jace Medical. Now, look, I know you guys come here for an escape. I think we're pretty good friends. We know each other. We talk to each other a lot by now. But I just want to take a minute to talk about real life. If that's okay with you. According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade, y'all. I, I can't even imagine a more helpless feeling than one of my loved ones being sick and then not being able to go and get the life-saving medicine that they need. Thankfully, it can be okay with Jace Medical and the Jace case. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to, to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, among many others. This stuff could happen to any one of us. Truly, it can. Uh, so visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medications will be dispersed or dispensed, excuse me, by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of of the regular cost. It has never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com and use the offer code locked on to get $20 off that first order. That's Jace, like case, J A S E, medical.com, and use the offer code locked on for $20 off that first order. 
So looking at each team's last game, I always think that's important when scouting out an opponent. And Kansas State played really well for like 30, 25, 30 minutes of that game. Now, they did not win. They lost at Kansas State. Uh, they have a big losing streak there in Lubbock. Uh, it was 60 to 59. And this game was just wild in terms of runs. Absolutely wild. So this this can show you how Kansas State can flip the switch like that. So they start off just throwing the ball all over the place. And at one point, uh, at like the eight-minute mark of the first half, they had as many points as they did turnovers. 10 each. 10 turnovers in 12 minutes. So they can play really fast and loose with the basketball. That That is a problem that they have had this season. But then they kind of stopped throwing it around. And they went on a 20 to nothing run and 23 to three to end the half up 11. So it, it's, and by the way, that starts on the defensive end. They held a team to 22 points in the first half, a team that's now in the rankings, a tough team in Texas Tech, a team that averages almost 80 points a game going in. They held them to 22 in the first half, which included at least 10 turnovers on the offensive end. This team is just manic. They're wild. Okay. Um, they, they hit 10 threes. They're not a three-point shooting team. They hit 10 in that game, but then they held to a season-low 18 points in the paint. So this, this is just nuts. They're, they usually score 35 points per game in the paint, and they did grab 14 offensive rebounds, which I talked about earlier is a big MO for them, and they did, or excuse me, they allowed 14 offensive rebounds. The MO is on the glass. Um, but they allowed 14 offensive rebounds and Tech was plus 10 in the category of second chance points. That's something Baylor has gotten really strong at since that Duke game specifically, um, where they have been rebounding the heck out of the ball on, on the offensive end, especially even though they were out rebounded on that end against Cincinnati. That's something that is a real strength to them. And so second chance points could be massive in this game for Baylor. Um, and so they end up with 18 turnovers. And they they win the turnover battle, or they, excuse me, they lose it by being doubled up. They turn it over 18 times. They force just nine for Tech. And but but I should say Kansas State had a stranglehold on this game until Tech went on a 14 to four run in the last like two and a half three minutes to win the game. They hit a three with 30 seconds left to play, and and then they stopped Kansas state in their tracks. I know there was some timing controversy at the end of the game, but 14 to four to end the game. Oof, that doesn't sound like a Jerome Tang team to me. No way, no how. In fact, Tang was pretty blunt with it in the post game. He said they're, t they were tougher than us. They were tougher than us in the battle. This, this nuts game between the two Scott drew assistants. It was Grant McCaslin who had the tougher team, but don't let that mistake you. Kansas state is Pretty tough. Pretty tough. Baylor, on the other hand, they held on to win, which was 62-59. So very similar scores. Uh, we talked about it on yesterday's show. I don't think any of the winning teams in the conference on Saturday had more than 70 points. Um, it, it was that kind of slugfest, tight, tight weekend. And th these are the fine margins. I mean, we, we talk about you know, Kansas State not even receiving votes this week in the AP poll, which is crazy to me. They're 12 and four. Um, they're ranked higher in Ken Palm than some of those teams that are on the list. Uh, I've got it here. Where are they? 57th, which, you know, is nothing fantastic or great, but that's better than some of the teams in the top 25. Anyway, they, uh, they end up not being in the, not being in the rankings, not receiving any votes, but if they hit a shot at the end, you better believe they're in it. Whereas Baylor, uh, you know, wins by three with after Cincinnati can't hit any of the two the two clean looks they get at the end out of the three shots, and Baylor's into the top ten from fourteen. So it, it it is that fine a margin. And close games is something that Baylor is starting to get used to. Um, it wasn't something they had a lot of through the non-conference schedule. Um, they kind of closed things out in that first game against Auburn, but don't have many cents. And that was something Scott Drew talked about after the game was getting that adjustment to close games and, you know, the people who are actually used to that on this Baylor team. This is what Scott had to say about that and adjusting to that. 
Coach, you just touched on it a little bit, but an overtime win in Stillwater, a tight one to BYU, then tonight, you know, a close one coming down to the wire at the end. What is this showing about the grittiness of your guys, but also just this conference in general? Well, I think uh, uh, the good Lord's blessed us, uh, first and foremost, with a couple close wins. And uh, our Fran Fischel always says this, ball's in the air, good coach, bad coach, good coach, bad coach. And we've had some go out for them. The big thing is we've gotten the rebounds and uh, – uh, we made free throws when we needed to make them down the stretch. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're going to learn a lot during this season, and the Big 12 helps you do that. So hopefully when uh, if you're blessed to get to postseason, you've seen, experienced, been in tight games, and you know what you need to do. Doesn't guarantee you're going to win, but uh, at least that, that experience is something that's beneficial. Yeah. I, he said we haven't played a lot of close games after they played really kind of three close games in a row. Um three that were decided by less than 10. One goes to overtime. One was tighter than the nine point margin against BYU. And then the other comes down to the final possession. So that he makes a good point there in that, you know, basically three tight games over the last week, all conference games, all really matter. And we were three and oh, including two of those against Cincinnati and against Oklahoma state, the tighter, uh, the, the two tightest games, I should say of those three games stretch, um, that come down to essentially one possession, they shot awful in both of those games. They were two for 16 against Oklahoma State. They were five for 20 um, in that in that win against Cincinnati on Saturday from behind the three-point arc. So when the number one three-point shooting team in the country is not hitting threes, they are still able to win close games. That And a team that is growing defensively, week by week. This is a good sign. This is what I meant when I talked with Drake yesterday of, are they the best team in the Big 12? Probably not right now. I think they're pretty close, but I think they are going to be. I think they still have room to improve on that defensive side of things. They can shoot free throws better. They can be better in transition on both ends. Uh, They're still cleaning up the turnover game. This team has the potential to be scary good here in a couple weeks. And what's scarier is we might not even realize it until the NCAA tournament with how good this conference is. You know, they could be on a real roll, but going to Lubbock uh, or going to Allen, you know, or going to Houston is not an easy place to go and win against, you know, some really top tier teams and what could be some really good environments too. By the way, this is a team that Baylor lost to twice last year, um, one in overtime here at home and then lost by double digits up at Bramlage. So Scott Drew has not beaten Jerome Tang yet, and he was asked about that relationship between he and his longtime assistant, what he's looking forward to in this matchup tonight against the Wildcats. Coach Tang does a great job. K-State fans are great. Uh, It's another Big 12 game, and uh, I know uh, they had a tough loss today, but going into today, uh, 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 Coach Mack, Coach Tang, both undefeated doing a great job with their programs. Uh, Not fun uh, uh, competing against somebody that you work with, uh, and and he knows everything that we do. Um, So uh, anyway, it's uh, last year uh, um, they got us twice. So uh, at some point he's (laughs) we got to get him. It's about time if you can get one, Scott. (laughs) We could have loved one last year, but it's a new it's new season. Let's turn it around. Get one. Uh, against the Cats tonight. One other thing I did want to point out, sorry throwing a lot of Scott Drew at you. I can't get enough personally. Um, but I thought was a really good point was he's talked about the Foster Pavilion and how much louder and how much more of an engaged crowd it is in the Farrell Center. I've been beating that drum. A lot of you have been beating that drum as well. And what I think is really cool is Scott has found a tangible learning experience from it. And, you know, with, with a, a couple of guys, a good portion of the contributors on this team who weren't here last year and don't know these Big 12 environments, haven't really been in one yet. gallagher Iba was nothing to write home about environment-wise in Baylor's only Big 12 road game. And we know it's going to be hopping up in Manhattan tonight. And here's what he had to say about the noise level at the Foster actually being a huge help for them, not only in those games, but when they go on the road. How do you feel that maybe, you know, playing in this loud atmosphere is prepping you to yeah. go up against that kind of environment? Yep, yeah, playing against Michigan State, playing against Duke, I think that really helped us for the Big 12 because those two environments were rocking and um, obviously uh, uh, very good teams. So uh, now it's a situation where um, 
in the Big 12, especially teams like K-State that know you so well, uh, players got to make plays because there's not a lot of cheap buckets, a lot of easy buckets. So you guys that go out there and actually make the noise and wave the rally towels and get into it and and stand up and, and respond when Coach Drew is firing you up, you are helping this team, not just on that night, but in the future. So keep it up. Keep it up. Wish this game was at the Foster tonight, uh, but Baylor will have to go to a, a truly tough place to play. Um, should be an interesting one tonight. When we come back, though, I want to talk about the future of this program beyond tonight because you're pretty excited about it. I am pretty excited about it, too. I can't wait to get VJ Edgecombe here. But first... I got to tell you about my pals over at FanDuel, which is America's number one sports book. We are elbow deep in the NFL playoffs. Okay. Congratulations to my Houston Texans fan listeners. Too bad. So sad for my Dallas Cowboys fans listeners. As George Strait said, no Cowboys in the Super Bowl. That's true for like the 30th straight year. Uh, that was bad. That was bad. Anyway, I say that to say this is a great time. We're in the playoffs. This is the time to be betting on games. You're watching them anyway. You're tuned in. You know about the strengths of these teams. So get on that. This is a perfect time to get in on FanDuel. And if that doesn't convince you, how about this? Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets for any $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets. Win or lose. And you can bet on anything, man. You've They've got a you know a parlay hub in there to see what other people are betting on. But you could do, you know, Live same game parlays, you can do prop bets, over under spreads, any of that, anytime touchdowns, all that great stuff. So visit fanduel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. That's fanduel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, America's number one sports book and official partner of the National Football League. All right, so looking at the VJ Edgecombe commitment once again. Oh, whoops, sorry. Um, this is maybe the most important recruiting get that Baylor has ever had in basketball. He is the second highest rated recruit they've ever gotten behind Isaiah Austin. And I think it, it is the birth of something really great for two reasons. First off, we have a really great thing going. I don't want to say that, you know, it's the Messiah. He's going to save us all. You know, he's going to do really well for us, VJ Edgecombe from Long Island. But, um, like, we're in a pretty good situation right now. The two things that really stick out to me about what makes this so great is first is the obvious. He had the option of anywhere in the country. But the three that he had on the podium were Baylor, Duke, and Kentucky. Okay, that that's what? 14 national championships between the other two schools up there? Baylor, I mean, Duke and Kentucky are like the two programs you think of when you think of college basketball, maybe of all time. And yet Baylor, scrubby little Baylor, beat them out. Baylor with their one national championship and their one final four in almost 75 years here. But it's because he realizes they're build, they're still building something. They are one of the premier basketball programs in the country right now, and they're still building. And he sees the you know, we know about the Duke lottery picks, we know about the Kentucky lottery picks, but a lot of people outside the viewership of this podcast don't know about Baylor's success with the lottery picks in the last few years, especially at the guard position. I mean. Davion Mitchell wasn't getting a, a, a shout of playing time at Auburn. He comes here, he wins a national championship, and he is a top 10 pick. Uh, who's it? Keontae George, who is more like a VJ Edgecombe example. He's a four or five star, depending on what outlet you look at. He comes here, plays here for a year, really honed some skills. He was already a knockdown shooter, but definitely honed some skills that helped him in the NBA. He's just outside the lottery, I think. What was he, 16 this year? And... Lo and behold, he's one, been one of the best rookies in the NBA this year. Instant impact for the Utah Jazz. So that's the first thing, was just picking Duke over Kentucky, or, or Duke and Kentucky, over Duke and Kentucky. Can I talk today just one time? Can I get a sentence out? Picking Baylor over Duke and Kentucky is a humongous win for this program. It just is. 
You have one of the very best players in the nation, a guy who can go anywhere he wants and is only going to play there for a year because ne the next year he's going to be in the NBA. Chose Baylor over Duke and over Kentucky. And I'm going to talk about Duke a little bit more because of the second reason why I really love this commitment outside of just how great a player he is. Because it reminds me, my, my older listeners will, will really appreciate this, those who were around in 1985-86. Uh, it reminds me of when Duke landed Danny Ferry. And that name might not resonate with a lot of you guys, but he was a humongous high school recruit, like a top 10 guy, a lot like VJ Edgecombe. And he was the apple of Dean Smith's eye at North Carolina. And that's basically what it came down to, Carolina and Duke. And this is Duke very early in the Krzyzewski days. They were hanging him in effigy on the campus. They wanted him canned. No, They wanted no part of this. Krzyzewski was on borrowed time. And he convinced Danny Ferry to go to Duke over North Carolina. It was the first time really ever, but especially in the Krzyzewski era, that they beat Carolina and Dean Smith to a recruit. Okay. Now, first off, the winning followed. He went to two Final Fours there um, at Duke. And you you might not remember Danny Ferry, but without Danny Ferry, there's no Christian Leitner. There's no Bobby Hurley. There's no Grant Hill. There's no, uh, you know, I mean, name your guy. There's no Elton Brand. There's no Shane Battier. Eventually, there's no J.J. Redick. There's no Kyrie Irving. That's what set in motion that one recruiting win set in motion, taking a small private school that had a, a little bit of basketball success before then, had made some Final Fours a decade before, and turned them eventually into the premier college basketball program of the last 35 years. Danny Ferry started that. And you might not remember the name, but I bet you Dean Smith remembered that name till the day he died. The one that got away. The one that evened the playing field between North Carolina and Duke. Baylor might have just had that with VJ Edgecombe. I know, they've had some big recruits before. Keontae George was a big recruit. Uh, by the way, the other two guys that are coming in with them straight out of high school are also pretty damn good recruits. And Jason Asamoda and Rob Wright, you have a couple great recruits this year, and Jacoby Walter and Eve Misi. But this is the, sh the watershed moment in terms of recruiting to beat out Duke and Kentucky. That is our Dean Smith. That is our beating North Carolina to a recruit, beating those two true blue bloods. That's how you make that next step. Blue bloods are not something that are typically like crafted. They just are. They're there. In fact, I talk about Duke being the premier program. They might be the only true blue blood that we've seen develop in the last 50 years. Before that, it was just always there. Indiana was always there. Kentucky was always there. Kansas, North Carolina, UCLA, they were always there. We are witnessing one being built right in front of our eyes, which is fascinating. It's stunning. It's exciting as hell. And maybe I'm overplaying this, but to me, Vijay Edgecombe can have that kind of effect on this program, which is already, by the way, trending better than the way Duke was when they got Danny Ferry. But this could really open the door. And when, v and when not if, but when, VJ Edgecombe succeeds at Baylor and becomes a lottery pick and they win a ton of games and they win the national championship, that is going to open the door to a new era in the way that recruits perceive this program. And it has already started, but they're going to say, man, you know, VJ, VJ went there over Duke and Kentucky, and we all laughed at him, and he was the one cutting down the nets and being selected with the sixth overall pick in the draft. So should we have been laughing? You know, because Kentucky and Duke, they weren't in the Final Four. Baylor was. That's what's going to happen here. Let me know what you think. Are you this excited about VJ Edgecombe? Leave a comment down in the comments below. Any comment helps. Let me know what you think about tonight's game against Kansas State. What you think about this VJ Edgecombe effect. Whether I talked about Duke too much in this podcast. I can do that sometimes. It comes with the name. Anyway, be sure to like and subscribe. Tell your friends. That is the only place that you're getting nothing but Baylor Athletics content five days a week. 
Thank you for making it your first listen today and every day. Drop your score predictions down below uh, for that Baylor-Kansas State game. We'll be back to break it all down tomorrow on Locked on Baylor.